Hey everybody, I hope you all enjoyed your spring break, but um, yeah, the 370 exam is coming up for those of you who are watching in winter 2022. Um, and I just wanted to provide you an additional resource. Um, uh, and so today I'm just gonna be walking through a couple of the problems from the fall 2021 X 370 exam. Um, and hopefully it provides you a couple of insights into how maybe to go about approaching the problem, maybe a little bit of an explanation for any questions you were confused on. Um, but I haven't looked at this exam since way back when it was written or way back when I was grading it. And so it's been four or five months. And so this should be pretty fresh, fresh to me as well. But um, hopefully um, I can, you know, get the correct answers and, and give you guys a little bit of insight how to approach some of the problems. So in this video, I'm going to be primarily tackling question one, um, which is going to be like the short question example. Um, but uh, I will break it up into shorter videos as we go. Awesome. All right, so the first page is kind of instructions. Um, this is a pretty standard exam, um, 20 minutes. Um, there's nine questions, uh, but yeah, let's uh, let's go get ahead and get started. Um, so um, first we have our true false questions. Um, the first question asks, uh, the number two to the negative, two, uh, to the negative 25 can be represented in IEEE 754 floating point, but not by two's complement. Um, well, the first thing I notice in this question is that the exponent is negative. Um, what this means is if we were to translate it to like a positive exponent, it'd be the equivalent of one over two to the 25th, which will translate into a really, 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 really small, um, you know, uh, decimal. Um, which is fine, it can be represented as floating point. But when we were talking about 32 bit two's complement numbers, um, what we're talking about are integers. So two's complement numbers can only re represent integers. And because this is not an integer, um, because this is not an integer, it uh, can't be represented. One second, it looks like my iPad got disconnected. Awesome. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, so, um, because this is not a uh, integer, we can't represent it. And so, um, I'm going to go ahead and say that the statement is true. Um, for the second question, it says, when sign extending a number, the resulting number's most significant bit, the MSB, will always be one. So, um, going back to what exactly sign extension is. Um, well, we apply sign extension when we're taking a number that is rep, uh, two's complement number that is represented in a smaller number of bits, and we try to expand it such that it um, apply it can be represented in a, a larger range of bits. And so, um, the reason sign extension is interesting is that we can't treat negative numbers and positive numbers the same. Because if I were to sign extend a positive number um, by adding a bunch of zeros in front of it, um, if I tried doing the exact same thing to a negative number, um, that negative number would all of a sudden become a positive number and vice versa. And so what we do is if it's a negative number, we tend to pad it with ones. Um, and if it's a positive number, we tend to pad it with zeros. So um, the reason I think this, this statement is false is because um, while it's true that if I was sign extending a negative number, um, I would pad it with ones. And so the most significant bit would always be one. Um, when I would, if I were to sign extend a positive number, um, it's, we call it sign extension because we're going to take the most significant bit and kind of duplicate it. And so it'll be a zero. Um, and so this is going to be a false statement. Uh, the third question asks, a load instruction can access memory that contains instruction machine codes. Um, this is gonna be true. Um, the reason for this is can kind of be highlighted by some of the examples we've worked through in projects 2C, as well as some of the homework questions. Um, if, you, if you even think about like project one, um, there was no real distinction between, um, between instruction memory and like data memory. 
Um, and so like we didn't really impose the restraint that the data couldn't be before like the final halt instruction. And so if you had like a bunch of BQs or um, jump instructions to navigate uh, your code, you could absolutely um, you could you could absolutely have your um, code execute um, non uh, or access memory um, that contains instructions, and you can even overwrite them and make self or or, or code that's self modifying. And so this the memory that is associated with machine code is no different than any other type of memory. Now, your operating systems that you're using at home try to impose try to impose a couple of restrictions for like security reasons, but when it boils down to it, at the simplest from the simplest viewpoint, um, they're they're exactly the same. And so, um, yes, I think this is a true statement. Um, looking at the fourth question, it says in a pipeline data path starting from cycle zero, we would have an instruction finishing its execution execution at each cycle. Um, well, I can think of two examples to kind of contradict the statement. So one example that comes to mind is that, let's say I have an ISA, which is broken into a pipeline data path. And there is, um, you know, there's that, that initial boot up time, right? Um, where uh, if I put, when I read my first instruction at cycle zero, right? Um, it can be in like the instruction reader, instruction decode stages, but it might not be done because it might take multiple stages. And so until that first instruction, you know, clears the pipeline, there's no chance of um, a, an instruction, uh, there's a chance that instruction isn't being executed each cycle. Unless of course the first couple instructions are all just one, um, one stage long. The other example that comes to mind is if I have like variants in um, the number of stages each instruction takes. Um, for example, if I had a data path with um, which was uh, five long, um, and I had two instructions that were currently executing, uh, one of the instructions that was currently executing took two stages, and one of the current uh, instructions that executed took one stage. Well, um, they're gonna they're gonna complete at the exact same time. Um, it's just that you can't like shove something else through the data path um, despite one taking less time. And so um, the, the, the core idea is that um, differences in, in uh, the number of stages that each instruction takes, as well as um, that initial boot up, the initial like uh, pipeline startup time or uh, cycles are gonna not have instructions executing. And so I'm gonna go ahead and say that this and uh, true and false statement is false. Awesome. All right, so now we're gonna look at a couple of, or a different format of question where we have always, sometimes, never. Uh, the way I like to approach these questions is usually just kind of um, try to come up with a contradiction for always. If I can, um, then I try to come up with a contradiction for never. And if I can find a contradiction for both of them, then it's usually sometimes. Um, but if I can't find a contradiction, it generally means um, that's probably the correct answer. So let's look at this first question. It says, for an arbitrary program, a multi-cycle processor's runtime is always, sometimes, or never faster than a single cycle processor, assuming the same latency for all components. Um, OK, so let's start with uh, always. Um, so what, what's a contradiction? for um, this, give me a second to think about this. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, what, let's say I had like a, a data path in which I had a number of instructions um, and uh, I only ever, let's say like LW is the lowest instruction we have in the LC2K uh, data path. Um, or, and so let's say that the instructions that we were executing or the program that we were executing, all it ever did was load instructions, right? So in the original data path, um, the load instruction took 50 nanoseconds. Um, but 
if I were to decompose that data path into a bunch of different stages, um, some of those stages might not take the same amount of time. For example, um, memory access or the stage that accesses the memory is going to be a little bit slower than the stage that does ALU computation, right? But because of the nature of a multi-cycle processor, um, the runtime of each stage, the clock uh, speed, is going to be determined by the slowest stage. It's going to be determined by the memory accesses. And so now, um, let's say memory accesses took 20 nanoseconds and I had um, three stages. Um, now, all of a sudden, my, my processor is running at, uh, or to execute a load instruction, um, I'm taking 60 nanoseconds, which is a lot slower. Um, while it might be true that if I was executing no op instructions in this multi-cycle processor, um, all of a sudden, my CPI would decrease because um, uh, it takes less stages to run a no-op instruction. Um, the, for an arbitrary program is what the question is asking. And so I can design it such that um, the multi-cycle perf processor performs worse. Um, on the other hand, if we look at like never, um, uh, it kind of goes back to what I was mentioning there is um, instead of running load word instructions every time what if i ran no op instructions every time each of no op instruction takes um 10 nanoseconds right it just takes a singular stage and so um instead of you know having in single cycle processors um the clock speed is determined by the slowest instruction right so it would have been that 50 nanoseconds for the load instruction but now that we've switched to multi-cycle processor, um, we can take only 10 nanoseconds for no op instructions. So it could potentially be faster. And so I think our answer for this one's gonna be in the middle with sometimes. Um, so then for the second question, it says given an arbitrary ISA with 32 bit instructions, increasing the number of registers will always sometimes or never decrease the number of op codes available. Well, let's look at always. Um, I can think of an example where it wouldn't decrease the number of opcodes. Um, and what comes to mind is, uh, let's say I had my original ISA had like um, six bits for opcodes um, and uh, let's say two fields of three bits. So a total of six bits for um, registers. Um, and then the rest was offset. So it'd be 20 bits of offset. Well, if I wanted to increase the number of registers um, by double, right, I would need to, for each of those register fields, I would need to increase the number of bits by one, right? So essentially, I need each of each bit field needs to be four long now, as opposed to three. Um, and so uh, if we want to visualize it, right, so we had our six bits, um, we had our three bits. Three bits, and then we had 20. And this was the offset. And these were two register fields. And we had opcodes. So now we want to double the number of registers. And so I want four bits here. I want four bits there. And I can adjust accordingly. Well, you'll see here that, like, I don't necessarily have to reduce the number of opcodes. I could maintain the number of opcodes at six. Um, instead, what I could do is decrease the number of offset bits. So I would now have, I believe, be 18 offset bits. While, yes, we are giving, making some sort of sacrifice because we do want to increase the number of registers, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be with the number of opcodes. So I wouldn't say always. Um, however, if we did say that we, we definitely wanted 20 offset bits, that was also like another mandatory thing, then yes, we could decrease the number of opcodes. We could go to four bits of opcode, right? And then we'd have four here, four here, and we'd still have 20 offset bits, right? So there's definitely examples for um, which contradict both always and never. And so this one's gonna also be sometimes. Um, all right. Then uh, the third question asks the CPI for a single 
cycle processor is some, always, sometimes, or never lower than that of a multi cycle processor. Well, let's think about what a single, the CPI of a single cycle processor is. Well, um, conveniently, it's always one. Um, and that's just kind of baked into the definition. Um, each instruction needs to be executed in a single uh, cycle. In a multi-cycle processor, at least one instruction needs to be um, executed in multiple cycles, right? Um, uh, just kind of by definition. Um, and so if we were to like average out the CPI um, across all instructions, um, you know, regardless of weighting, no matter what, it could never be equal to one. It would always be greater than one. Um, and so, um, it would be true, it's always true, that the single cycle processor is going to have a lower CPI. Um, so we're going to go always here. Um, for the fourth question, it asks, um, it is always, sometimes, or never better to save registers with callee saving over caller saving. Um, so this is one I'm kind of going to kind of point you towards your some of your experiences with projects to see um, and some of the homeworks. Um, and I think somewhere on this exam, uh, we, we're gonna see a similar question, but the idea is that um, in some contexts, call lease saving is going to result in less saves. Um, and in some contexts, it's gonna be um, result in more saves. And um, different variables or, or different registers might be better to store as callee saved, and some registers might be more optimal uh, to be saved as caller saved. And so remember, the core difference between callee save and caller save is that callee save says uh, that it's kind of the idea that before I as a function or before I as a particular piece of code modify what's in a register, it's also my responsibility to save what was in it before. And then I can go and modify it and put whatever I want in it. And then before I return to the function that called me, I need to um, restore the values into those registers. Um, whereas caller saving is the idea that um, uh, the caller, the function that is going to call another function, before it goes ahead and tells the other function to execute, it's gonna take those particular registers that are caller saved and it's gonna push them onto the stack or push them onto somewhere in memory. And then um, once that function, that function is free to do whatever it wants with those registers. And then once it returns, um, it can, the, the caller is also responsible for restoring those values that it put into memory. Um, but yeah, um, so um, one is not always gonna be better than the other, it's just, purely contextually based. And so if you're really interested in how, like, for example, my computer um, uh, decides which programs should use callee saving or caller saving, because I definitely don't program that into my computer, um, that's done in the compiler. And so there's a lot of interesting algorithms and they do some very interesting machine learning if you're into that um, with regards to compilers. And so if you're interested, you can take 43. But um, coming back to the question, the main idea is that um, it's going to be sometimes because um, there's not definitively like one that's better. It's purely contextual. All right. So that finishes question number one. I will um, hopefully pump out a couple more questions and, and hopefully you guys will get uh, and, and find this helpful. And um, yeah, so I'll see you later for question two.